Hi, and welcome to Chapter 4. In Chapter 4, we're going to cover a concept called ent Entity Relationship Modeling, or ER Modeling. And this is where you go, but Cheryl, we've been ER modeling this whole time. Why are we doing a whole chapter on it if we've already been doing it? Yes. So we're adding more to it. So we're adding some more details as time goes on. Um, this chapter will get you into a couple of new things um, related to your ER diagrams and help you to make them more clear, more concise, and add more detail. Let's get started. So when we're making our ER diagram, it's really important to understand the different aspects of it. This chapter is kind of weird. Chapter 4.1 goes on forever and ever and ever, and it describes all of these extra little things. And then chapter 4.2 and 4.3 are really, really short. So all of these are different pieces of that model. And I want you to think of it that way because these are all different things. While you're writing your model, you want to say, did I do this? Did I do this? Did I include this? And you'll see when we get to the homework for chapter four that you're just going to be making models. And we want to make sure you hit all of these different aspects of it. So starting with the top, our entities, which is the table itself, not an individual row of the table, but the table itself. That's called the entity. So you have to include those. With the ER diagramming, you're going to be doing at this point, you're going to start adding in your attributes, which would be your data fields. So you're not just saying table name clients, table name customers, table name um, owners. This is going to be the table and then the attributes under it. So all of those different data fields. And some of you have already probably started doing that. This is going to take that to a different level. So it's going to be adding more. Of course, the relationships. So we're going to have our lines connecting our relationships between one attribute to another to understand which ones are going to be connected and those relationships. Are they one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many? -to -many? Um, how are we doing those relationships? Don't forget with your crow's foot, you've got the, um, the little bar to say a one and the three little feet going off on the side to say many. Remember when you're writing your one-to-many. Then we're going to talk about Connectivity and cardinality, which is the relationship classification and your min and max occurrences, which I think I spelled incorrectly. Um, so that's your, your cardinality and your connectivity. Again, I'm going through each one. You're going to have a different slide for each one of these, these items. You're going to have dependence, existence, dependence. Does it really have to exist? Do we have to have this table? And does it have to be a one-to-one -one or can it be a one-to-zero to one? In other words, can it be optional? And we'll talk about optionality. Yes, optionality is a word. Um, we're going to describe weak entities. What are they? We're going to talk about participation in relationships. So how to entities relate to each other and how they have to participate in that relationship. We're going to have our degrees. That has absolutely nothing to do with Kevin Bacon, but I like any excuse to bring him up. Um, so the different degrees of relationships. And then, of course, we'll do recursive and circular relationships where in the table you are referencing another entity in the table itself recursively. And then our composite um, or a multi-value associative entities. So let's get going on those items. The entities actually refers to the entity set or the set of instances or occurrences. If we were talking about classes in Java, we would say it was the array that holds all of your individual object values. So you want to think of it as the entity set or the set of all of the instances that you have created of that object. We call it the table or the entity set. Um, and you can have multiple tables that would create multiple entities. So if I have three tables, I now have multiple entities, I have three entities. An entity doesn't actually refer to the data itself, and we'll talk about what that means later, but when we talk about the table, we're talking about the description of the table, the columns included in the table, how the table is designed with primary keys, foreign keys, how those all interreact, but we're not actually really referring to the instances of the data. It's just the table description. Kind of like, again, going back to classes, the class description doesn't actually refer to any actual instance. It's just the description. So a table row can be referred to as an instance or an occurrence. 
or you can call it a table row or a record or a lot of other things, but these are these are the pretty common ones. So when I refer to the instance of the entity, so if I have a customer's entity and I want to refer to the instance of it, it means each individual record or row that is in that table. That is your entity instance. And just like classes, entity names are usually written in all caps and they're usually a noun. So when we think about how we're going to define our entity, we might want to think of it as, like I keep referring, a customer, a client, an invoice. These are nouns. They're not verbs. They're not adjectives. Um, you will find that those exist in databases. And sometimes, depending on your database designer, you will have those um, in intermediary tables or the ones that connect your many to many's. You might refer to those in some sort of a connection, um, like maybe a verb, like in roles. Um, but most times they're going to be class, they're going to be nouns, and we like to put them in all caps. Again, as I mentioned back when we talked about the different DBMSs, depends on the DBMS as to whether that's important or not. But you want to be consistent in the way that you design your code, in the way you design the database. If you're going to write your tables as all caps, write them in all caps consistently. If you're going to use them in camel case, write them in camel case consistently. So decide how you want to do it and move on from there. Our attributes. So our attributes are those data fields. So we're going to have multiple data fields. Um, they're the characteristics of your entity. When we look at an attribute, we have options of is it a required attribute or is it optional? This is where um, you start keeping track of whether or not that value has a default value of null. Can it be null? Is there, a, is there an option of having no value in there? Um, or is it a required value? So if you have an employee, you might have spouse's name. Spouse's name might be optional because people aren't required to have a spouse, which is fine. But social security might, social security number might be required. You have to include your social security number for tax purposes. So that's a required attribute as opposed to an optional one. And we do think about that while we're designing our database, that this field is optional and this field is not. A lot of times someone will say, well, of course, obviously the address has to be required. City, state, zip has to be required. But sometimes it doesn't. Um, sometimes it depends. Do we really need to have um, the address or can we just do city, state, zip? Can we just do zip code and pull the city, state from that? So you want to think about those options while you're going through designing. We have the option of a domain. So I think we've mentioned before, a domain is the possible range of values from zero to infinity, from five to 10, from a class size of five um, to a class size of 25, GPA of zero to 4.0. So your domain, your set of possible values. You want to know this and we can include it in our ERDs so that when somebody looks at our ERD, they know those possible values. We definitely want to have our identifiers, our primary key, because those are the attributes that uniquely identify the instance, and they're very, very important. We can have composite identifiers, which we have also discussed in the past. The idea of having two or more fields define your primary key. So it doesn't just have to be a singular field. And again, those associative or those intermediary tables, sometimes your primary key is going to be a composite key of the primary key from your two M to, M to, M to N tables. Um, and that's a composite identifier. So you can have an identifier that is composite. If it is composite, it can be broken down into multiple values. You can have composite attributes. So you can have an attribute that is composite, that has more than one value in it. Um, and those could be subdivided down. That's how we kind of could define them as being composite is if we had our address city state zip all as one, we can take that composite field and break it down into subdivided attributes. Simples cannot be. So simple is a simple piece of information that cannot be subdivided down into multiple attributes. Again, along with composited, we can have a single value or a multi-valued. Depending on your database, you can have, say, a JSON field. Um, JSON is kind of like XML where you can put in different pieces of information so that when you pull them out, they're easy to parse. Um, so you could do an address field that was multi-valued, that included address, city, state, zip, 
and put those in a format so that they can be easily retrieved on the application side. If that's something you want to do, it's an option. And just because it's an option doesn't mean you have to do it, and it doesn't mean it's good to do it, but it means it's an option. And you want to think about all of the possible things while you're designing as you go along. So knowing that you can have a multi-valued attribute might give you some options while you're in um, designing your database. For example, a phone number could be an area code and then the seven digits. That could be broken down. You could break it into area code and then the seven digits separately. You could have a country code and area code and the seven digits, or it could all just be one field. So composite, simple, single-valued, multi-valued. Then there is the concept of derived. So one of your assignments for, I think it was chapter two, we did um, calculating your age for, or actually I think it was for your, um, your 7.1 through 7.3. We calculated your age from your date of birth. Being able to derive an attribute means that it can be calculated using other pieces of information. If I have a title, first name, last name field, I might want to have a um, field that is my, my, or my full name, something like that. A full name could be derived from the other three pieces of information. So you want to be very careful with your derived values of storing them or deriving them in your queries. This is really, again, a personal choice. Sometimes pulling it from the other queries and doing the calculation is expensive, cal uh, computationally expensive, and it's easier for you to keep that stored. You can store it with a function or a trigger that gets done when data gets changed so that it gets done and every time and you risk the data anomaly or the, the data entry error risk along with the benefit of the decreased computational time. Derived attributes are like that. So they can be calculated, but do you want them to be? Is it worth it for the time required to derive them? So these are things you think about while you're building your database. Most of the time we start by trying to put all of our attributes in um, as simply as possible. Again, it goes back to that normalization. And then we can remove attributes that are derived or add in um, individual attributes of derived values if we think it's necessary. Okay, the next one is relationships. So it's important to recognize that the relationship is built with three different parts in mind. The first is the participants. These are the entities that participate in a relationship, just like real life. Um, so you, in this case, have two people and they have, a, or two entities, and they have a relationship between them. So you need to know who the entities are that are in the relationship. The relationship can usually be described as a verb. And this is where, with crow's foot, you want to remember the crow's foot and the Chen notation have that little, that little label on them that tells you what the relationship is as a verb. A student takes a class. A class is taken by a student. So these are things you want to keep in mind with your relationships. What's the verb that's occurring between your two entities? So with the student takes a class, the student in the class are the participants, obviously. Takes is the verb, and it's an M to M relationship in this case because a student can take many classes and a class can be taken by many students. So you want to make sure you understand that relationship type. You understand what the name of the relationship as a verb is and who the participants are. Remember, it also goes the other direction, just like in real life. So it's not all one-sided. Relationships are not one person doing all the effort and the other person just sitting around. Um, relationships have to go both ways. So if a student takes a class, then a class has to be taken by a student. Um, if a aircraft is flown by a crew, then the crew flies an, airport, an aircraft. They have to go both ways. So we can have our relationship verb, and it might change a little bit, takes and is taken by. We're going to change the relationship verb a little bit between your different um, entities. So one goes one direction, one goes the other direction. And recognizing that directionality, so when you're looking at your entities, this one is taken, the student is taken by the class, or is take, the student takes a class, the class is taken by a student. So remember, it goes both ways. The relationship is not always a singular verb. Connectivity and cardinality. So connectivity is the easy part. Is it a one-to-one, -one, one to many or many-to-many? -many? We've covered this. So how are the two tables connected? They have the three different options for classification. 
one to one, one to many, many to, to many. And remember with your one to many, that means that the other direction relationship would be a many to one. So be careful about those while you're doing your diagrams. Cardinality. Cardinality refers to the minimum and maximum occurrences in the relationship. This is one of those interesting ones where you have to think about your relationship and is it something that must have, say if it was a, um, a one to many, um, is that one always one or could it be zero to one? Is the many always one to infinity or could it be zero to infinity? So you wanna keep track of those. When we talk about the cardinality, we don't like to use infinity unless it is necessary. Can it be infinity? Infinity is allowed. You're totally allowed to do an infinity for your cardinality. Um, but if you do know that you're, you're limited, so a class with less than five students is canceled, then your class cardinality has to be between five and whatever the max students in the class. So if we did 25 as the max students, it has to be between five and 25. Putting that in your ERD makes it better when you go to write your database because you know where to put the triggers and where to, where to, to add pieces of information at that point. Cardinality can be unknown. So it can be, I really don't know, and it can be infinite, which is zero to infinity. Those are allowed. Table descriptions do not enforce cardinality directly. You have to use the application software or the triggers, which we'll talk about when we get to triggers, um, to enforce those. You can enforce primary keys, you can enforce relationships, but you cannot enforce cardinality when you design your database. So cardinality is one of those really good things we like to know, we like to know what it is, we like to understand it, but we also understand the database is not going to enforce it for us. So it's good for just general knowledge, but once we get into the database design, it's something that needs to be added as a secondary requirement. Existence and strength. Okay, we'll start with existence. So existence dependence describes how important is another table to this table's existence. Or can the table exist on its own? So if I had a um, dependent related to an employee for, for uh, life insurance or uh, health insurance policies. So I'm an employee and the employee has dependents, might be a spouse, might be children, so on and so forth. And I needed to um, keep track of that. It's a little hard because I'm giving the word dependent in a dependence example. The two words are different. The dependent is your child or your spouse related to the employee. Can you have an entry in a dependence in a, in a dependent table, so your child, your spouse, your employee, um, or your child, without having the entry in the employee. If it can't exist, there'd be no logical way to have John Doe has a wife named Mary. Well, we have the wife Mary, but we don't actually know who John Doe is. That doesn't make any sense. So if the table cannot exist on its own, it's called a weak entity. The entity itself is weak. It is not strong because it cannot stand on its own. So when we talk about existence, dependence, it is its entire existence is dependent upon another table. That other table has to exist. So when we do that, we understand that that is now a weak entity if it cannot exist, and it is a strong entity if it can. Let's take this another step. Your relationship strength. Okay. Relationship strength is only described in crow's foot, which is one of the reasons we stick with crow's foot a lot. Crow's foot gives us the most pieces of information, so it's something that we can do in there. A relationship strength is based entirely on the primary key. In a weak relationship, we're, we're getting the strength of the relationship, a weak relationship, there is a non-identifying aspect to the relationship. So the primary key of the related table does not contain the primary key of the parent. Let's explain what that means. So I've got two examples here. Um, if you have a course and you have a course code and the course code is simply a foreign key in your class table, that relationship is weak because that course code is not part of the primary key of your class. In the second table, 
the primary key of the related table is included in the primary key of the parent. Other way around, primary key of the related includes the primary key of the parent. Um, that is a strong relationship. These two tables are now existence dependent. So the, um, the class cannot exist without the course. You needed to create the course before you could create the class. Again, when you're designing a system, you want to think about these things in your application design if you're at that point, or your database design. If I want to say I'm going to allow my users to create a new class, how do I have them do that if the course is not created yet? In this case, because I know that this relationship is a strong relationship and I know that um, my class requires the existence of the course, I can use that piece of information while I'm designing my system. When we design them in crow's feet, a weak relationship is dotted and a strong relationship is solid. So this is how you visually can see in your crow's foot ERD the difference between a weak relationship and a strong relationship. Because I'm looking at my crow's foot and I'm like, okay, they look exactly the same. Oh wait, but look, this is a dotted line. That means it's a weak relationship. So the primary key is not included in the um, primary key of the secondary table. Okay, this again is all listed in the book. Please comment on Teams if this starts to get confusing because there's a lot of information in this and I'm hoping that you'll get it and that you'll understand it, but just in case, I want you to stay close, okay? Let's keep going. So let's describe weak entities a little bit more. So we talked about strength. Um, we talked about existence dependence. We're talking about a weak entity, an entity that by and large of itself is weak, which means it cannot exist without its parent. So whatever the parent entity is, again, with that employee and that dependent, the dependent is dependent. It's a weak entity compared to the employee. The employee has to exist first. To have a weak entity, you need to have existence dependence, so it can't exist, and you need to have the primary key partially or totally derived from the parent entity. So in this case, the employee number has to be part of the primary key for the dependent to make it technically a weak entity. Knowing that it's a weak entity will allow us that ability to have a strong relationship. So the silly thing about it is you need to have a, to have a strong relationship with a weak entity. Strong and weak, strong and weak. So if you're reading this in the book and that strong and weak go back and forth, the relationship will always be strong if the child contain, um, the dependent on the child, on if the child is containing the primary key with a weak entity. You will not have a strong relationship without a weak entity. The only time you'll ever do it is when one of the entities is weak. Those are strong relationships. Um, so the example that we've given here is the one of the dependent again. The dependent table is completely dependent on the parent, on the employee table, and the primary key is either partially or totally derived from the parent entity. They added in a dependent number as well, which is always a good piece of information to add just from the sense of we want to have that number associated with it. But by making that employee number part of our primary key, we just created a strong relationship. Strong relationships are good, by the way. We like those if we can have them because they'll force things to stay in that data integrity issue and it'll keep things from getting muddled because of mistakes. Like it'll yell at you if you try to do something wrong, if you've defined something as a weak entity. It knows and it keeps track of it. Participating in a relationship. First off, we are not in a slave state here, optional or mandatory. Some relationships are required, like the ones with your family. Some are optional, like the one with your friends. I was going to go with your spouse, but then that becomes mandatory and so on and so forth. Um, so the ones with your friends are optional. The ones with your family are not. You have to be in a relationship with them. Um, the optional does not require the existence of a second entry. So if I have a relationship, with two tables. One of those tables is usually has a primary key that's a foreign key and so on and so forth. It does not require the existence of the second entry. You don't need to have 
that option that filled in. The example that we've given here is that you can have a professor at a college who doesn't have any classes. He, he hasn't signed up for any. He's decided to take a sabbatical. He's still a professor at the college. He's still listed in the database as a professor, but he doesn't have any classes, so it's optional. Mandatory does require the second entry. This optional mandatory is going to help you to design your crow's foot a little bit better and to understand that cardinality of zero to one. So you might have noticed in your homework for chapter two that I said a couple things about it was it a one to one or was it a zero to one? Was it a, a one to many or a zero to many? This is where we describe that a little bit better. So every relationship is both is two directional, it's bi directional. There are two relationships, A to B and B to A. A to B could be optional, whereas B to A could be mandatory. So it's important to recognize is the mandatory on the professor side or is the mandatory on the class side? Which one is required? In the crow's foot symbology, you've seen the three little feet to say many and the one or the line to say the one. So this is a one to many relationship. We add in a second little dash, which when I first introduced it, I literally just said, there's sometimes one and sometimes two dashes and then I left it there. That was kind of intentional. I wanted to know if anybody recognized that or caught up on it. That second dash refers to whether it is optional, which is an O or a zero, or whether it is mandatory, which is a one. So you can think of this as a bit, zero and one, being whether it's mandatory or optional. If it is mandatory, we put a line or a one in front of the one-to-many notation. So we have the example here of a zero-to-many, to which is an optional one-to-many relationship. This is the many side. The required many is a line and then the crow's foot. That is a one-to-many um, with the many side being mandatory. So mandatory is that little one. Optional is the zero. That's what those look like. You probably noticed at some point looking in your graphs that that zero and that one were there and you weren't entirely sure what they meant. Now we finally explain them. So zero and one to refer to optional or many. And then of course the one and the many for the one to many. We know that. So the example we have here, professor, professor teaches a class. The professor is mandatory. Can't have a class without a professor. So the professor has to be there. But the class is optional. You can have a professor without a class. So the professor to the class is a one-to-many relationship with the professor side being mandatory, two little dashes, and the class side being optional, a zero or an O, and then the crow's foot many. Okay, so hopefully that explains that many optional relationship participation. How do you participate in the relationship? Now we're going to talk about degrees of relationships. So. We can have a relationship in a conceptual diagram that allows you to have multiple tables related all at the same time. So we'll start with the first one, which is a urinary or a one airy um, relationship, which is just one table. It's recursive. The table calls itself or it calls entities in itself. And the example that we give here is that you have a table that has all of your employees. Each employee has a manager, and that manager is also an employee. So we can have a recursive relationship where an employee is managed by another employee. When we do our query, we essentially have to look at the employee table twice to be able to get these are the managers and these are the employees and how do we make them look right. But when we draw the diagram, we look at it like this. So we do a one-to-many mandatory or optional. In this case, they're both optional. Um, and the relationship type is a management. So who manages who? So that's, that's the first one, a one table relationship. You can also have a binary relationship, which is your two tables. That's the one we've been looking at. Those are pretty common. You should be pretty comfortable with binary relationships. You can also have a tertiary relationship or ter ternary. Um, ternary, ternary. I feel like there's a syllable missing. I often call them tertiary, by the way. Same concept, one's Greek, one's Latin. Both works. Those have three tables included. So we have a doctor, a patient, and a medication, and there is a doctor prescribes a medication to a patient. The relationship actually involves all three tables. We need to know 
who the doctor is, we need to know what medication they, they prescribed, and we need to know what the patient is. So the relationship actually exists between three tables. Remember, that's only conceptual. You cannot create a singular relationship in reality, in, in, in your logical design, that does three many-to-many's. However, you can in your conceptual. The way we solve it, as you probably guessed, is we add in another table that stores it. And that table usually stores the relationship between all three. We'll call it a prescription. And it's going to have a doctor. It's going to have a patient. It's going to have a drug. This is the relationship between them. You can have multiple degrees. We only give you the first three. We only name the first three because after we get to four, we just start calling it a fourth degree. Four tables, four degrees. Five to fifth degree, five tables. So you can have an N degree um, with N number of tables. And you can go up to a lot, but I would recommend staying away from that as much as possible. You will find that there are times like this doctor-patient medication type thing where you have to. It's, it's how the table needs to be designed. It needs to be a relationship between three, four, five tables. And those are okay. You just want to try to decrease those as much as necessary so that you're only using them when you have to. All right, so we have those um, middle tables that we've talked about with our M to N um, relationships. We call that middle table a couple of different things. I can call it an intermediary temp table. It's one that goes in the middle. It's technically called either an associative or a composite entity. So it can't actually be implemented as a many to many because we know that. The way we do it is we create this associative entity in the middle. I always think of it as, if you remember back to your high school math classes where we talked about the associative property, which was simply A times B times C equals the same thing as A times B times C, depending on where you put your parentheses. But I always said an associative property always has three options, or three values, three entities in it. It had, and I always joked and said it started with ASS, which was three letters, so there's always three. Um, but remember that associative simply means we need to add that middle table. So the associative entity is that middle table in the middle. Associated table is always a weak entity with strong relationships with both parents. Remember, weak entities mean they have to hold the um, parent um, primary key as part of their primary key, their composite primary key, and they have to be entirely dependent upon, their existence dependent upon their parent. In this case, a, a associative table will always have two parents, one on one side, one on the other. They will almost always include the primary keys from both parents as their composite key. The example that we give here is our student to enrollment and our class to enrollment. So the student, um, and I don't actually like the is written in and is found in. I find those to be kind of annoying verbs. Um, but we have our student and our enrollment. So our student is a one to many with the many being optional. Student doesn't have to enroll in any classes. They'll still, still still a student even if they haven't enrolled, but the student is mandatory. So we have our two little dashes on the one side and our zero and our many um, over on the right side. And then our class to our enrollment is also a one-to-many relationship, and it is also a mandatory on the class side and an optional on the enrollment side. So recognize your optionalities that are transferred from your associative table, so, um, or transferred to your associative table. So we started many to many, and we turned it into one to many, many to one, and it works. Remember, both students and classes can exist before anyone is enrolled, which is why they are optional. But you'll notice that both they're both primary key and foreign keys for your composite key in your notation. This keeps track of your associative entities, that middle table, to combine too many to many's. All right, so let's look at, you're starting from zero, you look at the assignment and you go, I have to write an ER diagram. Holy cow, that is a whole lot of things and I have to get them all straight. Try to follow the diagram. So first you're gonna think about your workflow. I actually would write it down. Um, what is your workflow? You need to understand it. You need to, to graph it out a little bit. You need to draw state machines. You need to, to draw some lines. We go from point A to point B to point C to point D. 
Okay, design your narrative so that you understand the operations that are going on in this project. Then identify your business rules. In some of your homework assignments, they'll give you the business rules because we're just being nice to you. Um, but figure out your business rules because your business rules are going to follow to the third step of identifying your entities and your relationships. Once you start to develop your entities and your relationships, you'll start to kind of get together. These are the tables that I'm going to need and this is how they're related together. Then we develop our conceptual ERD. This may not have all of the attributes or the primary keys in it yet. It's just the table names, just to get that initial ERD written out so that you understand how it looks and how it works together. Then go through every one of your tables and identify your attributes and your primary and foreign keys. So add those in. Finally, you go back and you can revise and review your ERD. Add in your cardinalities. Make sure at this point that you have added in any connectivities that you didn't already include in your initial. So your one to many, so make sure you add those. Your optionalities, whether it's optional or mandatory. Your cardinalities, your zero to many, one to many, those type of things. Um, and then suddenly you'll find you've built your entire ER diagram. It's not hard, it's just a lot of work. So give yourself the time to do the work. You'll be fine. Don't get overwhelmed yet. So it's really nice to be able to say, if you just do all of this, designing your database is easy. Yes, but there are three things that you are going to find when you design your database that are going to be challenges. There is the basic design standards, which are the things that I'm kind of giving you. They're the logical structures, minimize your redundancies, avoid your, null, your nulls, just the basic standards that we try to do when you're writing a database. However, sometimes writing it that way is going to make your processing speed way too slow. So at the same time, you want to try to minimize your complexity and your number of relationships because every time you have a relationship, you have to have a join. And every time you have to have a join, you have to do a cross product and then a select and then a project. So you're actually doing multiple steps for every join, which makes things take longer. So every additional join and every additional constraint increases the time required to process your query. So you have processing speed in there. When you're only working with small data sets, this isn't going to be too much of a problem. The bigger your data sets get, the bigger the problem becomes because those joins are going to get larger and larger. Finally, there is the simple basic information requirements. Do you have to transform your data? Do you have to do trade-offs between your structure and your requirements? And are there derived fields that could be stored instead of deriving them just to decrease your computing time? These are trade-offs and they're, they're things that you're going to have to compromise on while you're designing your system to make sure that not only do you meet your design standards as well as possible, but you kind of bend those to get processing speed if that's a problem or to make sure you hit your requirements that are needed. Um, and again, it's all fluid. It changes as you go along. You may find when you're first designing your database, you don't need to worry about storing those derived fields because it's easy and everything works fine. Suddenly, you realize you've got 100,000 records in there and your computing time is so slow because you're deriving that every day or every time it's called. If we just store it, I don't have to derive it. I don't have to calculate it. And that makes my life easier. So we go back and forth depends on individual circumstances and there is never a right answer. There's this designer thinks you should have done that, but there's not a perfect right answer to these. All right, that's chapter four in a nutshell. I hope I didn't go over it too fast or avoid things. I really recommend reading the chapter. It's kind of like I said, a long one, but there's a lot of little details in there and I wanna make sure you can get those. So from a summary, the ERM model uses an ERD diagram to represent the database. So if you get confused between the model and the diagram, why am I using an M instead of a D? Am I confused? Um, I actually had situations where I'll go in and I'll say, and so I'm helping you with the ERD and they'll look at me and go, don't you mean the ERM? And I'm like, well, yes, the model uses the diagram to diagram it. So the picture is the diagram. The model is the concept abstractly. 
they're exactly the same thing. Um, remember, the ERM, ERD, is going to include your entities, your relationships, your attributes, your connectivity, your cardinality, your strength, your relationship participation, and your degree, okay? One to, is it just using um, one table? Is it using two tables? Is it using three tables? Remember that degree refers to how many tables are in the relationship. I feel like I need to make a joke there. Um, your connectivity, remember, is that one to one, one to many, many to many, and it's based on your business rules. So go back to your business rules. That's why they're written down. Reference them. So think about it. When I'm making this relationship, is it possible for it to be a one-to-one -one or a one-to-many? How is that going to work? Many-to-many -many only works in concept. In implementation, it needs to be mapped using that associative composite table. A database shouldn't ever try to solve all of the business rules. It can't. You need the application or the, the thing you're doing with your database to do a lot of that for you. Um, validation of entries. Yeah, you can throw some code in your database, but a lot of business logic should be done on the application side. And that's okay, because a database, by and large, is not expected to fix all of your problems. A database is not an application. You need to build an application that uses your database, but your database in and of itself should not solve all of your um, business logic. I've actually worked for a company where they tried to put a lot of their business logic in stored procedures and triggers and things like that, and it was a bear. Uh, SQL's not designed to do that. Um, it can do a lot. And he actually, I mean, the database worked. It was just very cumbersome and very hard to read. So don't try to solve everything with your data structure, but try to solve as much as you can. Your UML diagrams are gonna represent your data structures. Symbols are similar to your ERD and they can be used as conceptual or implementation levels. So when we think of conceptual, we can have many-to-many -many in our conceptual. That's okay, that's allowed. You cannot have many-to-many -many in your implementation level. Okay, so keep those straight. And you will often find that you will make compromises. De design standards, processing speed, information requirements, these are going to come back and you're gonna have to kind of balance them. How well can I do on my design structures while still thinking about processing speed and making sure I hit all of my information requirements? Okay, let's talk about your assignments. The first part of your assignments is the review questions. There's a little more here than I normally would give you, um, but there were a lot of things in this chapter and I wanna make sure you understand them. Some of these are just terminology. Um, what does this mean? What does that mean? And then we move on to individual things. How would you graphically do this? That was seven. Um, nine is what would you do with a multi-valued attribute? How would you design it? And I want you to kind of think about it. I give you an example of like you have an employee and included in the employee is their, um, so they have an attribute of their degrees. Okay. How am I going to have multi-valued? Because I want to hold the degree. I want to hold the, the bachelor's, master's. I want to know what subject it is. I want to know what school it is. Um, I want to know the date. How can I store those as an attribute with my employee? Um, derived attributes, what those are, that's number 10. Your conflicting database requirements. I think I've said it both in the summary and on the slide. I think you've got those. And then um, 17 through 20 are going to ask you details about cardinalities, um, composite entries, and dependent weak entities. And then number 21 is actually a, more of a project on the review questions. They give you a lot of business rules, and they want you to say, draw a data model. So you're going to go write your crow's foot ERD based on all of the information that was given. Be sure you read the directions carefully to help you decide what you're going to do for each one of those. Okay. Okay. So there's about 10 or so, um, 10 or 11. No, I think it's 10 problems in there. I'm giving you four. I've given you an example of what a crow's foot ERD should look like. Problems two, five, seven, and 10 are the, two, are the four that I want you to do. For each one, read the directions, actually do what the directions say. So if I get something wrong, listen to the directions in the book. Be sure that you include all of the attributes that go with an ERD crow's foot. So entities, attributes, keys, primary and foreign, you've got your relationships, don't forget to label them, your cardinalities, optionalities, connectivities, your weak and strong notation, 
with that solid line or dotted line. And then any additional requirements. So some of those say, oh, and by the way, here's a B section of it, do this as well. You'll see the example I gave you, which was four, which is not one of the ones that you have to do, but you can see the way that it has done the um, entities, the attributes inside the entity, separating out the primary key at the top, labeling it as a primary key, separating out a foreign key, putting foreign keys um, labeled as an FK, so including those, and then of course your crow's foot notation for your relationships with your label for the relationships, whether it's weak or strong, using solid lines or dotted lines, um, and then of course your cardinalities and connectivities, so your optionals, um, optionalities, optional or mandatory, and one to many's. These do not include that one dot dot one or the zero dot dot m. Um, in a way, I'd like to say add them anyway because it makes me happy, but you don't have to. It's not part of the requirement for this. But I would like as much as you can give me as far as cardinalities, if there are any. Remember, cardinalities don't have to exist. It could be I don't know versus I don't know. But if you do know, please go ahead and add those in. Yes, I want you to do the case problem, and yes, this will probably take some time. And it will probably take a couple of pages. So you'll be writing this in Word or something like that, and I would bet that this answer, when you finish including your, your ERD and all of your business rules and your entity names and your attributes therein, you will probably have two pages, maybe three, maybe bigger. It depends on how big your ERD is. Um, there's about four pages of description before it actually gets to the question, which says, go write an ERD. Um, with this one, it just describes an entire project. Imagine that you went to a client, you went to a, a, an assignment for your job, and the client hands you all of the information between 162 and 165 and says, here's what we do. And you're sitting there scribbling notes like crazy, trying to figure out how I'm going to build a database around this. So read it, read every one of them, stop and build your business rules. Some of them I think are written for you, write more, there are more. We didn't give you all of them, we want you to go figure out the rest of the business rules from all of the detail we have given you. This is the big part of your assignment. Um, I'm gonna write in the rubric how this is gonna get broken out, but I'm gonna tell you now that this is worth a lot of this assignment. Yes, you have to do the ERDs. Those are worth more than the terminology questions in the review, but this is the big part because I want to know if you can take all of that information and build an ERD from it. Don't forget when you write your ERD, entities, attributes, keys, relationships, cardinalities, optionalities, connectivities, um, weak and strong notations, all of that needs to be in your ERD. So if I'm counting correctly, you will have one ER, definitely one whole ERD in your review, four in your problems, and then this big one. So at least a total of six ERDs for this assignment. Again, lots of work. Um, hopefully you're feeling comfortable with your ERDs and you're getting comfortable with writing them and designing them and your one-to-many relationships and your business rules. It's just going to keep adding a little bit more on each time, um, at least for next week as well with five and six. So please contact me if you have any trouble. Please start early. Please don't come back to me on Sunday, you know, at 6 p.m. and say, I haven't even started yet. What's an ERD? Um, I, I, you guys will be fine. I'm not worried. Um, send me an email or text on Teams if you need me, and have a fabulous week.